On the 20th of March 2020, the S&P 500 index fell to 2,300 points from a previous record high of nearly 3,400 points, which was reached just a month earlier. There was a very good reason for this. It had become obvious that the COVID-19 pandemic would not be contained to China, and case numbers throughout Europe and America were swelling into the hundreds of thousands. The stock market is an infinitely complex entity, and some of the most brilliant people in the world dedicate their entire lives to predicting its movements, most with little success. But there is a general rule that most investors agree on. If people are optimistic about the future, the stock market will rise as people want to put their money in a position where they can cash in on that optimistic outcome. If people are pessimistic about the future, the opposite happens. People pull their money out of the market in case they lose their job, or in case they need to support their business, or just in case there's an opportunity to buy back into the market at a lower price once it has crashed. In March of 2020, most people were understandably on team pessimism, which is why it came as no surprise that the stock market experienced one of its most intense downturns ever, losing 30% of its value over a month. In the two years that followed, the news hasn't been much better for the businesses that make up this index. There have been short-term fixes, not least of which was huge quantitative easing and corporate bond buying initiatives from the Reserve Bank, coupled with fiscal stimulus from the federal government, but those were by their nature a temporary fix. Life support, if you will, for businesses who probably shouldn't have been expected to plan for a 1 in 100 year event like this. These fixes are also very likely coming to an end. The political will to continue to support private companies is waning, and inflationary pressures are forcing the Fed's hand into tapering their expansionary monetary policy. Despite this, the world is not in a much better position than it was two years ago. Labour shortages, supply chain issues, threatened tax changes, all to say nothing of case numbers that make 2020 look like a warm-up. Despite this, the S&P 500 index uh, was up by over 100% from its low in March of 2020. That represents the single most intense bull run in American financial history, leaving many people on the sidelines thinking, what is going on here? It's perhaps not coming as a huge surprise to those same people that the market looks like it is finally heading in the opposite direction. As of writing this video, the S&P 500 is down almost 10% from where it started this month. Similar downturns have been felt in other major securities and crypto markets, and many are expecting this to overflow into less liquid assets like real estate. So, it was just one question for this video. Is this the inevitable financial downturn that we should have had two years ago? We have seen that governments are remarkably capable of keeping an economy on life support, but perhaps that only delays the inevitable when they are forced to pull the plug. Now as always when discussing financial markets, it's time for the big disclaimer. This is a developing issue and there is a very real chance that markets will be back to all time highs before I finish writing, recording and editing this video. We are not here to make predictions about the future, we are here to try and make sense of the present while learning a thing or two about economics as we go. I have not personally changed my investment strategy which is simply putting away a set amount of money every month into a low cost index fund and paying off the mortgage to an investment property. But with that out of the way, to understand the fall we must first understand the rise. Stocks simply represent an ownership stake in a company. They normally allow investors to vote on issues within the company and most importantly, they allow investors to share in the profits distributed from that company. This has historically been done through dividends. If a company has a net profit after tax and nothing better to do with that money, they will pay it out to their shareholders. If you are a CEO, giving money to your shareholders consistently is also a great way to stop them from voting you out. There is also another way that companies can return money directly to their investors, and that's through share buybacks. Again, if a company finds that it has profit left over after tax, it can use that money to buy back its own shares in public markets. This only directly gives money to the shareholders who decide to sell their shares back to the company, but it indirectly increases the value of everyone else's shares, which to many investors is actually preferable because you don't pay tax on appreciating share values, you do pay tax on dividends though. Of course, all of this relies on companies actually having money left over after paying costs, expenses and taxes. Some of the largest companies in the world are famous for going very long periods without ever turning a profit, meaning there were no chances for dividends or stock buybacks. 
Investors were still happy to invest in these companies though because there was the chance that given enough time and money, they could turn into corporate behemoths capable of making more money than an average company could ever dream of. Sometimes this strategy pays off and sometimes it doesn't. I am sure most of you already know all of this, but it's important to really keep in mind while we try to make sense of the market over the past few months. There are a few companies that have genuinely benefited from lockdowns. Food delivery services, online shopping retailers, streaming companies and social media platforms being the most obvious. We were stuck at home and we needed something to do to pass the time while having stuff delivered to us. These companies have not only benefited from a new captive audience, but they've also had a new, very profitable market opened up to them. Remote working systems were needed and fast. Fortunately, these companies were there to provide an array of solutions. Software as a service to business is incredibly profitable. Large companies can pay tens of thousands of dollars a month for enterprise software, which enables them to let their employees work from home. Look at the revenue of a company like Microsoft and their growth explodes in 2021 thanks largely to the digital infrastructure they give to businesses. Now, obviously not all companies have been so lucky, but that hasn't really mattered. The growth in the big headline indexes like the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones have mostly been fueled by a dozen or so of the largest companies in the world. Because these companies are so large, they take up a disproportionate amount of the indexes which are weighted by market capitalization. Of the 10 largest companies in the S&P 500, seven of them are tech companies. One is Tesla, which is kind of a tech company. One is Berkshire Hathaway, which is a holding company comprised of almost 50% Apple shares. And the last one is Johnson & Johnson, which isn't a tech company, but has also not been having a bad year. Just these 10 companies comprise over a quarter of the weighted value of the S&P 500. If these companies do well, it almost doesn't matter what the rest of the market is doing. This is a chart of the S&P 500 in the months after the initial downturn. The performance of the top 10 stocks recovered within two months, while the remaining 490 companies lagged behind their previous peak until the end of 2020. Another way to look at this is to exclude all tech companies from the index, which makes the most intense stock rally in history look rather tame in comparison. Many stocks, especially those of companies in affected industries, have not recovered at all. Tech and healthcare have done well. Everything else was just along for the ride. We actually explore this further in our video on why the stock market is at an all time high. Of course, that's not the whole story. Despite these large companies doing well for themselves in the pandemic, the total earnings of all public companies was still down in 2020. Fortunately, tech had an ace up its sleeve yet again because investors naturally expect lower returns from this industry. Price to earnings ratios track, as the name might suggest, how much a company is worth over how much the company earns normally broken down to individual shares. A company that generated huge profits but for some reason has a very low market valuation would have a very low P.E. ratio. A P.E. ratio of 5 for example means that a company would generate its market cap in profits every 5 years. Hypothetically, if the company distributed all of those profits as dividends, an investor could earn back their investment in those 5 years without even needing to touch the underlying shares. Some companies, especially technology companies, have much higher P.E. ratios. Tesla, for example, has a P.E. ratio of 303, meaning that it would take the company 303 years at their current net income to pay out the value of their shares. For context, the price to earnings ratio of General Motors is 7, and that's high by historical standards. If you think that's bad, there are a lot of public companies that currently make no profit at all, meaning their P.E. ratios are practically infinite. Investors are happy to accept these higher P.E. ratios for a few reasons. The first is if they think the company has a strong potential for future growth. A company like Amazon didn't turn a profit at all for more than a decade, but its investors happily kept on throwing money towards it because they saw the potential it had to become the online shopping juggernaut it is today. The second reason is because a stock might have intrinsic value beyond its ability to make money in the short term. Facebook acquired Instagram for an extremely high price to earnings ratio because the synergy of the two brands was worth more than the individual company operating alone. The third reason is because they have no better option, which is really the one that we need to focus on as it relates to the market rally of 2020 and 2021. One of the big things the Federal Reserve Bank did during this time was buying up lots and lots of corporate bonds from American companies. 
This artificially drove up demand for corporate bonds, which lowered their yields. If a bond sells on the open market for $100 and pays $10 in interest every year, then it has a 10% yield. If the Fed comes along buying up all of these bonds and drives the market price up to $1,000, then that 10% interest payment would only represent a 1% yield. Bond traders try really hard to make this sound more complex than it needs to be, but that's basically what happened. Investment grade bond yields collapsed at the same time that people were starting to worry about inflation. It's no good earning 4% interest on your investments if inflation is 5%. So what were investors to do? They could pull out of the market entirely, but then they would still have the same problems with inflation, which really meant their only option was to buy shares, no matter how overpriced they were. Since the GFC, the S&P 500 has averaged a price to earnings ratio of around 20, meaning that earnings of all of the companies in the index would take 20 years to equal the market cap of the index. In 2020, PE ratios spiked to over 35 because companies were making less money while demanding higher valuations because investors had nowhere else left to go. These factors combined with a significantly high household savings rate, then, you know, let's be honest, the fear of missing out on the mother of all bull runs to give us the mother of all bull runs. So then, what has changed now? For a while, the stock market rally almost looked like it was making sense. Vaccine rollouts meant that there was the hope of life getting back to normal. Unfortunately, that hasn't necessarily played out exactly like we may have hoped, and markets have started to realise that this will be an issue that well outlives the government stimulus measures designed to get businesses through it. If there was a time to reconsider the market's reliance on easy money, it was going to be last week, as the Fed met to discuss its monetary game plan in the new year. Market anxiety around this meeting saw a lot of investors pull out of their positions so that they had the cash ready to put towards either stocks or bonds depending on which way the Fed went on interest rates. Powell would later announce in a press conference that interest rates would remain on hold at 0%, which gave the market a slight boost as investors got back on board the cheap money bandwagon. This rally was later reversed when the Fed chairman went on to answer questions about inflation and future plans for interest rates. They acknowledged that inflation had become a concern and that they would likely be raising rates in March or April to combat this issue. They also made it very clear that corporate bond buying would stop and actually be reversed as they try to sell off their newly acquired holdings over the coming years. These announcements probably shouldn't have been a huge surprise, but by this point the market had enough inertia that even the confirmation of bad news was enough to sustain the daily declines. Regular viewers of the channel will probably know what I'm going to say next. Investors love nothing more than stability and confidence. The last two years have undoubtedly had a massive negative impact on the global economy. But the government and the Fed did a really good job of publicly displaying that they would protect businesses from the fallout. Was this worth the price that they paid? Well, maybe not. But nobody is arguing that it didn't give confidence to market participants. The same confidence just isn't here in 2022. The stock market is not the economy, and the economy is not the stock market. They are correlated, but one doing well does not mean the other can't do poorly. We have seen the economy do poorly while the stock market has done well. Now the economic metrics are looking up, we might start to see the stock market go in the other direction. Potentially the biggest factor here is the hardest to quantify. Human nature. I am sure there are many investors out there that were baffled by the market rally experienced over the past two years and have almost convinced themselves that a correction is inevitable. Once they see a few big red days, they will sell their positions to either stop the losses or to try buy back in at a lower price. Unfortunately, this doesn't usually work out the way they expect it to. In the long term, this is probably for the best. Good investors should have a time horizon measured in decades rather than days. So think of this as an opportunity to buy the same companies from two weeks ago at a 10% discount.